Good evening. This is What's Going On. I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is John Munn, a candidate for the Davis City Council. John, I want to thank you for being on our show. My pleasure. Oh, good. I hope. Oh, well, we'll see where it goes. So, um, why are you running for City Council? Well, I think the city needs to get its financial house in order. Otherwise, we aren't going to be able to continue to enjoy the things that make this Davis and a place we love to call home. And I have a concern about decisions that have been made at the city council level that don't seem to really have been for the benefit of the residents uh, compared to one or another special interest group. So I thought the best way to approach dealing with that would be to uh, be on the council itself. So you served on the Davis School Board? For four years, uh, 1997 through 2001. It seems like a uh, hundred years ago. Well, in some ways it was a hundred years ago because the dot-com explosion happened right at the end of that. We were in the process of trying to get computers into classrooms while I was on the board. And the strategy at that point was that it was the teachers that needed the computers so that they could learn to use them and then teach the students. I'm not sure it doesn't go the other way at I this point. I think it does. I think it yeah. pretty much does. Well, you know, we've, I, have a, I have a friend who's an eighth grade teacher and, and he teaches history and, you know, I gave him a cartoon where the father, the son says to the father, um, I'll help you with computer if you'll help me with history. And, you know, what the, what the kids are learning today, if it's older than two weeks ago, it's irrelevant to them. And they don't understand a lot of the ways that society has come together based on our historical experience. Well, my experience right now has been primarily away from schools, so I can't really talk about the way things are now in the classroom. Okay. Well, I do want to talk about one thing, which is um, you, you ran for school board, which is a nonpartisan office, and there were two other people that were announced candidates, Joan Salee and, and Marty West. And um, because you're a registered Democrat, somebody else, I'm sorry, ooh, because you're a registered <laughs> Republican, now, that, where will we go with that? Because you're a registered Republican, a Democrat ran against you because they didn't want to have any Republicans on the school board. Now, my report <laughs> is that at the end of that time period, the superintendent of schools said it would be great if there could be five John Munns on the school board because John Munn comes prepared, he's ready to work, and he's ready to make decisions. So, um, I. It was a different time, but the school board now is faced with some interesting challenges, some of which are their own making. And I think that part of the connection now is that the city council has gotten itself into some predicaments that are awkward at best. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to follow up on what you were saying because I'm not sure that five John Munns would be a good idea anywhere I've, because I you need the variety in order to come up with the best solutions. And when I was on the school board, I got to serve with really good people. I uh, had Joan Salee there and Marty West, Don Saylor, and Ruth Asmonds for a couple of years, followed by John Polis. And they were all good people. We worked together and we were able to work as a team. The story that I tell all the time, so might have heard this before, is that uh, although I was elected when I was the Republican Party's county chairman here in Yolo County and people thought, oh, what have we done? It's a crazy conservative. On most issues, I would say I was not actually the most conservative on that particular issue. I mean, we had instances where other members were more fiscally conservative or at least tighter with money other cases where other members were a lot uh, stricter with discipline. 
And in fact, I think if I had had to live under the rules that we were trying to enforce on our students, I never would have made it through high school. Uh, different time, but um, you serve with good people. Uh, I got to be the third vote on quite a few 3-2 votes because you get five people together and you never always agree on everything. It doesn't matter you know, what the party label is, people come to an issue with you know, their own experience and their own opinions. Well, there is one issue that particularly motivated you to put your hat in the ring, and that's Measure P. So why don't you talk about Measure P? Well, Measure P really is about water rates, because uh, after we went through the Measure I election, and it became obvious that the city was going to go ahead with a surface water project, whether it's a good idea or not, I mean, we're not going to re-debate that. Then it was the council's job to figure out how they were going to pay for the water project, which is extremely expensive. And they came up with a rate system that put a disproportionate amount of the burden onto single family homeowners. And in fact, uh, we're going to look at situations if people didn't cut back on water use. If they still used the same amount of water that they had been using as they were going um, into the major uh, I or right at the time of Measure I, uh, city service bills might be approaching $3,000 for many of those people, and that's annually, uh, by 2018 when we actually get to the rates that the council uh, has established. They, the council was, um, I guess, politically astute, but at the same time, uh, I think we we're kind of hiding the P on the cost because they actually borrowed money up front to keep the rates down and then slowly raise the rates over a period of time. That makes it difficult to argue that rates aren't out of control because in the short term uh, they're being held down with borrowed money, whereas in the long term um, they're going to go up very rapidly starting next year. So how important is P in terms of the future of the city as far as you're concerned? Well, I think if the city were to continue to go on the same trajectory that it's been headed with water rates and increases in other city service rates and increases in taxes, uh, it's not just Measure O. I mean, the city's already shopping around a parcel tax for November, which they believe is needed for roads. Uh, at the same, same time, the school district has its variety of parcel taxes. I'm, my belief is that this is going to price out of town our middle income residents. Those are largely the people that have children and families uh, along with fixed income residents. It's going to change the character of the town in ways that uh, I don't want to see. So if P were to pass, what impact would that have? Uh, well, unfortunately, I can't promise that rates aren't going to go up because we have to pay for the water project. Uh, but what we can do is structure the rates so that the cost of the water project is more fairly apportioned among our residents uh, so that we don't drive our single-family homeowners out of town. So who would absorb that increment of increased cost? Well, in my view, the way the rates are structured now is that uh, primarily renters and people in apartments, uh, and in particular people who aren't in town during the summer, uh, would be paying a disproportionately smaller part of the cost of the project than I would say is fair. So we are going to be looking at people who, you know, are renters paying more? If Measure P passes. If Measure P passes and then the board re redoes the rates in a way that I would say uh, equalizes the amount we pay per gallon of water. Um, anything else you want to say on Measure P? Well, or the I, water project? I think Measure P is uh, very important to pass. Like I said, we don't want to uh, re 
uh, argue the water project. Well, I think you do want to well, want to re-argue, but you're not going to. Well, it it doesn't provide any, you know. It's not benefit. an issue it's at not this good, point. Yeah. Good for the community. I do want to point out, however, how fortunate we are in our current drought to still be primarily reliant, if not fully reliant, on groundwater because that buffers um, our water supply uh, at least over you know a year or two against the kind of drought that we're suffering right now where other communities are going to be severely uh, impacted by a lack of water. Well, we aren't. So the idea of moving away from groundwater to surface water has some real downsides as well some as some risks for sure but as upsides for surface water so this year if we were under if it was five if five years from now we're in this current climactic situation what would davis's priority be in terms of access to the groundwater that we're counting on well we'd still be in better shape because if you're what what you're assuming is that we have a drought like we're having this year and it continues, well, there will be almost no surface water in right. five years. Right. Right. Uh, groundwater would become more of a problem because it wouldn't be replenished. And right. we're, what we're doing is we're sitting on top of a reservoir. And unless that reservoir can fill up, all we're doing is drawing it down. Right. Right. And that is not a good situation either. Certainly we would be in a, in a very, um, world of hurt. Well, I don't want to call it a world of hurt, but we would certainly be working to conserve to a lot greater degree than is necessary at the moment. Or that we're willing to even consider. Well, see, I can some see. people are, are considering an awful lot of conservation right now, which is yeah. another problem with the rates that the uh, council has established. Uh, the rates are uh, put together assuming that a certain volume of water is actually going to be used, and that's the volume of water that gets paid for. If people conserve more than what the council has assumed, then the demand for water is going to drop, and the amount of water that is sold by the city is going to decline. But the fixed costs, and particularly these huge new fixed costs that we've taken on for the water project, aren't going away. So and we're going to have to up the rates in order to pay the fixed costs. To generate the revenue that's been budgeted. That is not just budgeted, that, that is due. Well, it's that catch-22 that the government is, according to 218 and whatever, that um, the government's required to only charge you what it actually costs, but they can't charge you for costs that somebody else didn't get captured. So you never get to 100% no matter what. Well, I don't, I don't actually follow that as being true because there are surpluses built up in the uh, enterprise funds. And so you have, when, if you're running a surplus, you have to be at least caught up. Right, right. Well, I, I'm arguing for caught up. I'm not arguing yeah. for having a... I think you have to be conservative in the way that you do it to try to ensure that you don't end up short. You know, I, I got to tell you, my, my current model for most things in life is a bladder. It's like two thirds full to one third full. I mean, when we live in an urban, when we live in an urban society, it's really an organic thing. And we need to think about ways that the limits are, are maximized. I'm, I'm getting off field enough that I'll get in trouble. So um, there are other financial problems that the city of Davis is not doing a very good job with. What's your opinion about how to become um, more in control of the financial future of the city? Well, I think getting control of the financial future of the city needs to start with actually figuring out what the city's revenues are, what they can be used for, and what its real spending and expenditure needs are. Uh, I get in some trouble with this when I talk to people because everybody wants a quick answer. And I don't think there are quick answers for where the city is because we haven't done the work of 
figuring out where the holes are between revenue and spending. We need to go through the process of finding those holes and then we can talk about whether these are holes we want to fill or whether we want to reduce the actual services that are being provided in that area. But I, I really, I think it's extremely important that we be able to have an open conversation with the community about that. Uh, one of the issues when I first came on the school board was a very large lack of trust between the employees, um, the public in general, and what was going on with the schools because it seemed like we would go through a process of doing negotiations for salaries or other spending and then find money. And it's like there were hidden pots. Everybody thought there were hidden pots. And so one of the first things that we did as a new board when I came on along with Marty and, and Joan was elected uh, was to open the books. And so everybody could see what the schools had in the way of revenue and what we had in the way of spending. And then we could have a rational conversation about compensation. I think we think, need to do exactly the same thing with the city. Now the city is more complicated. That, uh, you know, schools are focused on educating our children. And, and that's their reason for being. And, you know, whatever else happens in the school setting is, is really designed for that. Now the city has lots of different um, activities that it's in charge of that are different. I mean, everything from what we were talking about, which is water service, and, you know, garbage pickup service, those kinds of services to parks and recreation and other kinds of services that are very different. Uh, so the city is a much more complicated setting. Uh, so it's not going to be as straightforward to open the budget, but it has to be done because we're, if we're going to seriously talk about balancing a budget that's at least five million dollars in the red and probably more because that doesn't really account for the long-term needs for pensions and health care and road maintenance. We're going to have to have the trust of the people that what we're doing and what we're asking of them has a real purpose, something that they can understand. Uh, this idea that we can uh, have a budget proposed and, and a red flag run up that gee, we've got a $5 million budget deficit. Well, why? You know, what's causing that? Well, I don't know, but you know, revenues are $5 million short of spending. Uh, it's a bad way to do business in my mind. So at the risk of being facetious, that's called the budget process. Well, that's the budget process I would envision if well, I'm elected. I, I well, okay. I, I just want to say that five years ago, I was on the Business and Economic Development Commission, and I became the liaison to the Finance and Budget Commission, and I read the budget. And the narrative in the budget hadn't been changed in the last five years. The numbers had been changed by the departments, but nobody had actually read the budget. So I'm just telling you that we're in a similar circumstance now where people know what their part is, but nobody's looked at the whole. We're in a transition now to a new city manager, and it's a key point in time where everybody should be getting on the same page. I'll agree. Um, you know, city manager is going to be a key decision because our current city manager has, uh, you know, gone on to other opportunities. Uh, the council is in the process of bringing in an interim manager, so the next council, whether I'm on it or whoever's elected, is going to have the job of hiring a new city manager, which is one of the most important things that a council does. Is, as I see it, the role of the city manager is really to work with the council as we develop whatever the priorities for spending are going to be, or any other program priority. And then it's the job of the city manager to implement that through the staff. Uh, I found it to be extremely important on the school board 
that you not be reaching past the superintendent because that undermines their ability to work with the staff. But on the other hand, you have to trust your city manager or your top executive, whatever the title may be, to actually implement the priorities that they're given. They can't come in with their own agenda, so to speak, and kind of set you know, the elected body over here while they pursue it. it won't work. I, I look at it like this, where the manager is the interface between the staff and the, and the governing body. Uh, the governing body needs to be holding the manager accountable, and the manager's job is to make the staff do the day-to-day -day operations that are supposed to be done. Um, in, the, in the school culture, there's a real strong relationship between the superintendent and each member of the board of trustees. They meet on a regular basis. Um, I'm not sure if it's that comfortable with the city council. I'm, I'm, what kind of factors do you want to have in the city manager? I think I already pretty well described it. And I know, I did a great <laughs> job of not asking the question and you answered it because I did such a great job. But I, 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 I really want a manager a who will be responsive to the priorities of the council and will be looking to the council for direction at the same time that, that they know that they're in charge of getting it done with the staff. And in case you didn't get the question the first time, that's the thumbnail answer. Um, parks and Recreation is a great example of joint use between the city and the school district. Where do you see Parks and Recreation going in the next five or ten years? Well, I, I really think we need to go through the budget process to figure out uh, what their current activities are and how they're being supported. I, I know that there's a multitude of special interest groups, you know, because a special interest group isn't just somebody who's out to get money from the city. They're also the people that are, you know, taking services from the city. Um, so everything from, you know, swim teams to intramural sports teams uh, or intramural sports that relies on the city to provide the setting for their activities and the support. Um, and I think we need to figure out how we can continue those services, but yet have the city fiscally sound. Right. I, a point I think I really want to make while we have the chance here is that um, a city going broke is not a city that is able to provide the kind of services that the community wants. Uh, and if we go through a budget process that identifies holes, whether they're in parks and recreation or whether they're in our streets, which I think we can see with our eyes, um, then the question is going to be, well, you know, what do we do to fill those holes? And uh, that's the conversation that we have to have with the community to tell us what they're willing to provide if we truly don't have the revenue to continue a particular activity or service. And that might be taxes, uh, it might be fees, but I don't think we can go there until we're able to have that conversation and we have the trust. The, to a certain extent, that was a loaded question because Parks and Rec is the ultimate special interest group. <laughs> well, I know they, that, that people that are, you know, taking exactly. advantage of the services can be very vocal. Well, and I, and the I have people been that, that benefit the, from the services. And I've been there in the right, past, right, so it's well, not like, you know, this is foreign to me. Sure, sure. So, I mean, what about law enforcement? What about, you know, fire and safety? What the, how do you give people a sense of what your priorities are? Well, I, I really think you start from the bottom up and you ask, well, what, why does a city exist? What is the purpose of having a city government? Um, and, of course, 
two of the primary purposes are you know, law enforcement, which protects us from each other, so to speak, and you know, our fire protection and other kinds of emergency services that helps keep us whole when bad things happen. Uh, they are essential. Uh, we always make decisions about you know, how much are we willing to spend to be house safe, but certainly those are two of the primary functions of the city. So you can't ignore them, and they, they, they need to be there. So wrap up. Why should people vote for you? Well, I think I have the skills um, to help solve some of the big problems that the city is facing, uh, both financially, structurally. I do know something about roads. Uh, have an engineering background to go along with my soil and water science background so that I can speak to things that other council members whose backgrounds are, you know, perhaps in the legal area or the medical profession, you know, don't have the same experience. It's what I was talking about, the team. Right. Uh, when I was on the school board, I was able to bring certain things. Other people brought other things. And together, I think we made a better package. I want to thank you for being on our show. Well, thank you. For sure. Um, this is what's going on. I want to tell you a secret, which is that I'm voting for Rochelle and John Munn, and I hope you vote on June the 3rd. Thanks for watching. This is what's going on. Good evening.